am pleased to welcome you tonight to the last event on the occasion of the exhibition Making Kin. Thank you for coming and joining online. Today is also the last day of the exhibition and I would like to take this opportunity to thank again the artists Melanie Bonayo, Madison Bycroft and Anne Duki Jordan once again for the great collaboration and the strong contributions to the show. Many thanks also to our supporters, the Mondrian Fonds, Zeitstiftung and the Dutch Embassy and also our team, of course. The closing event is dedicated to future scenarios and deepens Donna Haraway's call for cross-species symbiosis. First, through a lecture by the sociologist Franziska Dahlmeier. In her research, she traces the practices of caring for endangered plants in the technical scientific environment of the botanical gardens, asking in her lecture how people, plants and technology transform. After the lecture, the author and philosopher Eva Meyer will read her essay from the publication Recipes for the Future, which will be published very soon, hopefully in mid-September. I like the short description that follows. The book contains 16 recipes, but is not a cookbook. Everything is possible. Art, kitchen gossip, conversation, analysis, treasure truth, oracle. It believes in the future for dreams and mushrooms. And touch. It doesn't believe in anything except for trying to do better. But let's start with Francisca first. Francisca Dahlmeier studied in Hamburg and Leicester and has been working and teaching as a research assistant in general sociology. Her research applies feminist and multi-species approaches to topics of science, technology and environment. In the scope of her research on botanical gardens, she focuses on the paradoxical sustenance of nature through artificial ecologies, which depends on a variety of technological interventions far removed from ideas of untouched nature. A warm welcome. So, um, the title of my talk today is Making Kin with Plants in the Botanic Garden. Caring for plant life in apocalyptic times. Um, in my talk, I first um, want to talk a bit more about um, Donna Haraway's work um, because yeah, the exhibition was <laughs> inspired by her. And uh, then I will focus a bit more on the notion of care. And then I will come to my field site, the Botanic Garden. Okay, so. In her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, the professor of environmental and forest biology and uh, indigenous scholar Robin Wall Kimmerer recounts a story from one of her lectures in, on ecology, in which she asks her third year students to fill out a survey on negative interactions between humans and the environment. They come up with plenty of examples. Confronted with the question of positive such interactions, uh, Cam Kimmerer says the median response was none. Kimmerer states and continues, and I quote here, I was stunned. How is it possible that in 20 years of education, they cannot think of any ben beneficial relationships between people and, and the environment? As the land becomes impoverished, so too does the scope of their vision. When we talked about this after class, I realized that they could not even imagine what beneficial relations uh, between their species and others might look like. Then Camera asks herself, how can we begin to move toward ecological and cultural sustainability if we cannot imagine what the past feels like? End of quote. Hearing this story um, offers a profound exemplification as to why Donna Haraway, who inspired this uh, beautiful exhibition, is deeply committed to what she calls speculative fabulations. Following the anthropo anthropologist Marilyn Strathern, Haraway is convinced that it matters what matters we used to think other matters with, 
It matters what stories we tell other stories with. It matters what nots not nots, what, thought, what thoughts think thoughts, what descriptions describe descriptions, what ties tie ties. It matters what stories make worlds, what worlds make stories. This to me resonates deeply with Kimura's thought on her, account, on her encounter with her students, I just relate. In order to get out of the destructive um, situation called the Anthropocene, in which humanity's influence um, on Earth has become destructive to the point of an already ongoing six math extinction event and dire climate change prognostics, we need other stories and other ways of life urgently. If we accept that thinking and doing, imagining and living cannot be separated, it is high time to infuse our imaginations with, with alternative visions, uh, alternative ways and visions of humans and other than humans relating to each other. Instead of throwing one's hands up in despair in the face of devastating ecological uh, destruction, a reaction Hellway sees as one of the great dangers of our time, alongside the idea of easy technological fixes that will save us, um, because those, yeah, those visions render us actually immobile and offer us, uh, us an illusionary exit so we don't have to change our ways. Haraway calls upon us to make kin with our myriads of non-human significant others and to stay with the trouble that, to a large degree, we caused and now have to learn to bec become also, her words, Haraway words, responsible to. Significant others are others we depend on and who depend on us in immeasurable and unforeseeable ways and with who we sympathetically make each other in the flesh, as Haraway puts it. Donna Haraway's concept of sympoiesis states that, that nothing produces itself autopoetically, but always already is in a becoming with, with something else. This is a quote by her, Sympoiesis is a word for worlding with, in company, end of quote. In other words, to make kin, and in order to do, to do this, we need to stop treating other than humans as mere resource we can exploit and harm endlessly, and need to start treating them like the kin they already are to us on a much more horizontal plane of existence that turns humans into one player among others and not the central one. Like with the human kin that came before us, we only exist because of them. Haraway's notion of odd kinships centers dependency with, within techno-scientific nature cultures over pa patriarchal and modernist notions of the independent, autonomous human subject. No living being in this perspective can be or really is independent, but always depend, dependent on a multitude of specific and oftentimes invisibilized human and non-human others, and is always connected to those. Um, this exhibition, sorry, <laughs> I'm sure Donna Haraway would have loved, or would love, <laughs> if she was here. It connects humor and playfulness, um, blown up suddenly highly visible bacteria, humans, plants, robots, and all kind of, kinds of critters and technology as well, as well as affectivity and spirituality together and critically reflects on and searches for other modes of being together in nature cultural settings. In other words, um, it infuses our imagination with speculative fabulations about humans being only one actor in the world among others, instead of the only exceptional one that matters. It therefore renders us sensitive towards our role in relation to other non-human actors in the world, without forgetting um, power relations, as for example in Melanie Bojanos, Bojanos' uh, video installations. Still, seeing this exhibition is a hopeful endeavor, at least it was for me. <laughs> if making kin is about fostering livable relations, living with mutually involved sympoietic companion species, um, as I said before, centers notions of dependency and is effectively charged. This brings us to another practice important to living well, or at least better, in more than human worlds, in odd kinship together that one of Haraway's human companions, the feminist philosopher and STS scholar Maria, Maria Puch de la Bella Casa, puts at the center of her work, care. 
Care is a symbiotic relational practice and is embedded in mutual dependency from the get-go and is an existential necessity, as Puccella Bella reminds us. This is, this is Maria and um, her book, Matters of Care, which deeply um, yeah, influenced me. So um, I, I quote her. I think I have, yeah. <clears throat> not, all, not all relations, uh, Maria says, not all relations are caring, but very few could subsist without some care. Even when care is not assured by the people or things that are perceptibly involved in a specific form of relating, in order for them to merely subsist, somebody, something has had to be taking care uh, somewhere, sometime. But if care is necessary, it is not given. For life to even be, it needs to be fostered. At the heart of the matter of making odd kin in Haraway's storytelling might lie Puch de la Bella Casa's care. Hers, and I have some, yeah. Something spelled out here. Um, hers is not at all a fuzzy, romanticized version of care, as, and here I quote, a warm, pleasant affection or a moralistic, feel good attitude, end of quote, but an often hard and exhausting, always ongo ongoing, mundane, material practice full of ambivalences and conflict. It can be, but it is oftentimes not fun to care. Beyond that, how to care well is a situative art that can never once and for all be settled and it oftentimes borders on control or actually turns into practices of control, which can be equally, equally as harmful as neglect. Still, care we must in order to repair and maintain the webs of life, as Puch de la ba Bella Casa puts it. The difficult question of the borderland slash neighborhood between practices of care and practices of control is especially important for my own research and the question of hopefully more positive pu uh, future uh, human involvement with other than humans in times of anthropogenic extinction. Not only has my field site of the botanic garden, which you can, so yeah, so this is the, the setting of the field work I did. Um, not only has my field site of the Botanic Garden in England grown out of violent colonial projects, botanists and adventurers traveled aboard the colonial ships and collected exotic plants in the col colonies to bring them back to Britain for scientific, aesthetic and economic reasons. Colonial endeavors in which the Botanic Garden is enmeshed are also part of the gen genealogy of the destruction of habitats, as well as alternative ways of relating to other than humans. The botanic garden that understands itself now as a kind of Noah's Ark for endangered plant life is a non-innocent space itself. But in regards to the conservation practices of care happening in the botanic garden, which I looked at in my research, I'm also interested in the following questions. How much control do we want humans to have over the survival of, for example, plant life in techno-scientific nature cultures? nature cultural settings like the Botanic Garden or other similar artificial ecologies. Maybe I can show a picture here already of the inside of the so-called tropical nursery at the garden. Um, so you can see like the yeah, kind of dystopic, I think, looking <laughs> setting. Um, so, um, and how dependent do we want the survival of other than humans from human practices and technology uh, to become? And how can we maybe newly increase the degrees of freedom, freedom of more than human life by letting it re-enter into relationships with their non-human companions? Think here of like, this is like pretty well known by now, the, um, this idea of the um, <laughs> wood wide web, um, the, like the forest in which like the, the tree roots um, enter into like symbiosis with uh, fungi and this allows plants to communica communicate with each, other, with each other and also, like, for example, warn each other in case um, of the arrival of predators or to share resources with, with each other. So this is not possible, <laughs> in, at least not in the nurseries of the botanic garden. So um, my question is, like, how can we um, 
it increased the degrees of freedom, freedom of more than human life by letting it re-enter into relationships with their non-human companions in order to prevent new forms of humanist control within the Anthropocene. There indeed is something as plant communities, which are like humans can be part of, but they, they are their own communities that can only be fostered in a limited way within ecologies um, that are completely techno scientific and controlled by humans, like the Botanic Garden. I'll show you. I don't know. So, yeah. Um, pushing against uh, ideas of such renewed centering of the human and adding layers to speculative imaginations of care. Importantly, to Puch de la Bella Casa, care does not stop with human practices. More than humans also provide care to humans in uncountable ways. Care thus, much like the influential, I don't know if you know him, French STS scholar Bruno Latour stated in regard to the notion of agency, um, which he decoupled from human intentionality and at least in social sciences quite scandalous, scandalously extended towards non-humans, Care is not just a human practice, like agency is not uh, just a human uh, practice. This also points to what uh, with Puch de la Bella Casa can be described as a circulation of care. Even though in a particular instance it might appear as if there is one carer who cares for one particular being, the cared for, and this is what care is all about, on a profounder level, care is never only a one-way street taking place between two particular be beings, which are still mostly considered to be humans, but rather it constantly permeates the care, constantly permeates the natural cultural tissue, since no being, as I said earlier, following Haraway, lives completely independently of other beings and elements. We are all symbionts in this sense. So to sum up, care is not as located in, in one actor, but is circulating, but it circulates between many human and non-human agencies in what Puch de la Vela calls um, the web or a web of life. Within this perspective, it can be said that no one cares alone, also not humans. Care happens in communion with more than other, with more than human others. In the case um, of my field site of the botanic garden and the tropical nursery that you saw earlier and that, that you see pictures of uh, now as well, in particular, which, which has the conservation of endangered and extinct, um, in the so-called wild already extinct plant species, um, as well as their scientific exploration on its agenda, this care at face value seems um, to be only uh, a, a, care, a human care for the plants considering how dependent humanity is on plant life in a myriad of known, known and still unknown ways, it is fair to say that care for plants and the setup of what I want to term an infrastructure of care in, in the botanic garden, which keeps endangered uh, plants alive in the world, is that by taking care of plants, um, one simultaneously um, takes care of humans too, since we live in kinship with, with each other and to, for, to care for one to care for another is to simultaneously care for ourselves. Okay, back to my field side. The botanic garden, um, which I yeah, conceptualize as an infrastructure of care in my work, um, the botanic garden with this vast technological setup. Here you can see, I might talk about this later. <laughs> um, uh, so the, the vast technological setup is thought in this way, an emergency care system for humans as well as for particular critically endangered species of plants. Since the tender plants that are put in this tropical nursery in the botanic garden um, are being removed from their original habitats, or rather these habitats are being destroyed <laughs> by humans or by human practices. So they are permanently made dependent on human as well as technological symbionts, without which they are not, to, um, not able to survive, in, in this case, in the northern European climate conditions. So in this sense, they are still alive, but at the same time, they are not able to survive independently of these technological and human practices anymore. So in this sense, the tropical nursery designates what the multi-species ethnographer Eden, Evan Kirksey calls an emergent ecology. Maybe I have the quote. Yeah. Um, 
in an attempt to leave behind the either or of untouched wilderness or catastrophic destruction that inevitably leads to apocalypse, Kirksey, following the anthropologist Anna Singh, focuses capitalist ruins, for example, abandoned coal mines, within which plants or fungi began to re begin to regrow and connect to what is given in a specific place to build a new ecosystem. But also artificial ecosystems like the tropical nursery I researched, um, in which endangered life forms are being held in the world by technological means and human practices of care can be addressed with Kirksey's notion of emergent ec ecologies, which the actions of people um, whose instrumental use of certain critters or love for some kinds of life has led them to construct novel ecosystems, bringing machines, industrial supply chains and biological elements together into unusual assemblages. The endangered, li endangered life of tender tropical plant life in the botanic garden produced by the um, technological control of multiple environmental factors that make plant life possible within artificial ecologies, and which I want to outline in a bit uh, of more detail now. Um, since, as I said, Northern Europe's climate condition do not, conditions do not correspond, correspond to the tender tropical plants' environmental requirements, their life on standby in the tropical nursery possible without uh, possible would not be possible without the uh, vast infrastructure of care of the tropical nurseries, the glass houses, the heat banks, the humidifiers, the shading system, and uh, continuous care practice by the expert gardeners. The for aforementioned nurseries' technological apparatus, for example, consists of sensors, here you, can, you saw them before, <coughs> um, of sensors installed in the midst of the 21 different climate zones of the glass house. Here they detect, for example, the level of humidity and in case of the level becoming too low, um, the sprinkler system, which is automatically triggered to release water. Changes in outside temperature and irradiance are constantly being measured by the weather station on the rooftop of the tropical nursery. The data obtained in the station is being sent to the nursery's computer system. As you can see here, uh, no, there. Um, via which the automatic shading is being changed accordingly. Yeah. The technological infra infrastructure fails, and uh, like the, the, this climate control team comes to immediately fix it. This makes clear how putting plant life on, on standby, as I say, in the garden which in its everyday use and in other contexts might trigger uh, ideas of savings of energy, requires an immense amount of infrastructural setup as well as continuous maintenance and care work by humans and energy in the sense of vast, amount, uh, vast amounts of electricity and water. It also exemplifies my earlier point on how fundamentally dependent plant life, being stripped of all their life-sustaining relations in their natural habitats, is being made dependent on perpetual human and technolo technological interventions within these artificial ecologies. For example, one of the gardeners' jobs ent entailed here to literally become a pollinator. The lack of insects um, in the nursery made hand pollination necessary. So coming back to the notion of apocalypse I alluded to in my title, I want to argue that as much as, for example, hospitals are considered critical infrastructures, so should be institutions or organizations that, that serve the con conservation of critically endangered species like plants in times of habitat destruction. Succinctly described the tropical nursery as an intensive care unit for plants, not because the plants themselves are sick, but rather the environments they used to live in are. In face of catastrophic anthropogenic climate change and habitat destruction and mass extinction, artificial ecologies like the botanic garden become vital. One of the biologists speaking at the state botanic garden but termed the plants there as living zombies, neither, what I said earlier, neither alive nor dead or, or, or rather extinct in the wild and only artificially held in the garden. An understandable but rather dark view that one of the expert gardeners at the tropical nursery only partially shared. To him, plants meanwhile, um, him plants are put on standby in botanic gardens only to, pull, to be fully activated, meaning seeded and planted again after critical incidents or once the conditions are being made available for the plants to be naturalized or rewilded into their original habitats. 
The botanic garden therefore serves, as it already shows in the term conservation uh, practice or con conservation in general, as a kind of standby storage unit for the plant life that is continuously being exterminated in other than humanly made infrastructures. Donna Howay reminds us that while we should be wary of easy sounding techno fixes, and I quote her here, it remains important to embrace situated technical projects and their people. They are not the enemy. They can do many important things for staying with the trouble and for making generative odkin." End quote. In this light, to understand the botanic garden and the tropical nursery as an infrastructure of care is not to say artificial ecologies like them are the sole answer to ongoing apocalypse. Rather, they can humbly serve as refugial infrastructures in the current situation termed Anthropocene, a refuge of care to keep specimen of endangered plant species alive, whose habitats or climatic uh, living conditions are being destroyed. They are life-sustaining patches in times of ecological destruction and pro produce care on multiple levels in the everyday practices of the gardeners, in the technological means they provide, as well in the plants chosen to be put on standby there and being held in the world in this artificial manner. If these plants die, the care they are providing to humans and so many non-human others in the web of lies dies with them as well. You no never know what a standby plant in the garden can do or become and what its um, importance to a specific e ecosystem really is or can be, what ex extin extinction, in other words, would really mean. And considering that no human being has been capable of artificially recreating the process of photosynthesis in the lab yet, and they are still far from it, even what we know a plant can do is more than vital to humanity and the planet. It is, it is thus, and not only because of that, vital to provide care to plants and our other, what Haraway also calls messmates or odkin and companion species. Botanic gardens can offer indispensable spaces in which humans non-innocently non learn to care for and make, plan, uh, make kin with plant life as well as recon recognize what vital caregivers plants are to us and maybe also where the limits of techno-scientific artificial ecologies lie. Eva Meyer is a philosopher, artist, author and singer-songwriter. Her work centers around language and social justice. She successfully defended her PhD thesis entitled Political Animal Voices in September 2017. She is currently working as a postdoctoral researcher in a project on the actions of non-human animals in the Anthropocene at Wageningen University in the Netherlands and writes philosophical columns for the Dutch newspaper True. Maya's essays and publications have been translated into 17 languages and won numerous literary prizes. Her first academic book when Animals Speak Toward an Interspecies Democracy was published in November 2019 and received the ASCA Book Award 2020 given by the Amsterdam School of Cultural Analysis. And I'm very happy that for the reading right now because it's a premiere tonight. Starting point of the book Recipes for the Future is the COVID-19 situation. Here, a shortened synopsis. We were lost for a moment. Everything could have happened. Everything between the lack of grated cheese and the death of most of humanity. Somewhere in between on this scale, the cancellation of all art events in Europe a world without visible art. What did and does that mean to the artists and creative professionals? What would they want to save from the time when everything was still as we knew it? What would you do differently? Better? What do you dream of? This kind of questions was asked to a selection of creative people 
across the disciplines by the cultural team from the foreign representations of the Netherlands. Thanks to the team, especially to Astrid Kaminski, who introduced me to Eva Meyer. Recipes for the Future combines taste and thought, cuisine and funeral, breathing and digesting. Um, I very much look forward to the publication, but now it's about dreaming a future. A warm welcome again to you, Eva. Thank you very much, Anna, for this uh, lovely introduction and also for inviting me to speak today. I'm very sorry I cannot be with you in person. Uh, in fact, I cannot even see you, my dear audience. I can only see a uh, microphone, but I will pretend you are there. And if you also pretend you are there, then I'm sure we'll get somewhere. So, dreaming a future. Drexia. A, mythical, a mythological coral city on the sea that is inhabited by beings who are both fish and human. They are descended from the women and children who jumped overboard or were thrown from ships in the days of the transatlantic slave trade. In the series Watery Ecstatic, which consists of watercolors, films, and other work, the artist Alan Gallagher lends a new voice to those who will forever remain silent. In Drexia, she gives the past a different future. The future of those who are alive today does not look very bright. Climate change, the loss of biodiversity, large-scale extinction of animal species, and pandemics will likely change life on Earth beyond recognition in the coming century. This will also increase the social inequality between groups of people. Our age is sometimes called the Anthropocene, well we just spoke about that um, in the questions after Francesca spoke, so I don't really need to go into the problems with uh, that term anymore, but however you describe it, there's something going on in this geological age and it has to do with the influence of humans. It is however important to recognize that uh, the Anthropocene makes it seem as if it is about the acts of the human, uh, but that makes it seem as if it is about the acts of all humans, but that's not true, not all of human activity um, uh, contributes to the problems that we are facing now. It's actually about the actions of a very specific human subject that feels superior to the natural world, that measures progress economically and that emphasizes autonomy. We know that many people are thinking about this Anthropocene now and the problems that are interconnected with it. People seek solutions in uh, technological development, as Francesca also mentioned, um, uh, and sometimes they argue for adopting a more modest attitude. Faith in reason plays a very important role in these kinds of uh, thinking. Uh, in philosophical tradition, I'm a philosopher, uh, reason is regarded as the uh, capacity that sets humans apart from the other animals and it's placed in contrast with emotion. But it's precisely this attitude of the human as an exception, uh, as the only rational being, that has led to the problems that we are facing right now. Reason is of course a critical faculty uh, and we can use and should use our thinking to criticize the thinking and the acts of the past. This is necessary for us uh, to be able to do things differently. Toni Morrison said that all future is in the past. But thinking the new or envisioning change requires something else in addition to this criticism, something that I will today call dreaming. So that we can imagine uh, better worlds like Gallagher's cities uh, and approach the future with a more open attitude. The Absaluki or Crow nation, uh, an American indigenous people, dreamed the future. 
In Radical Hope, Ethics in the Face of Cultural Devastation, the philosopher Jonathan Lear describes in detail how this worked. After visiting a sweat lodge, young men would go to a remote place where they fasted until prophetic dreams uh, would come to them. Sometimes if the dreams that not, did not arrive uh, fast enough, they cut off one of their uh, fingertips. There were different kinds of dreams. Some dreams were ordinary dreams. Um, sometimes uh, they, the people had um, uh, wishful dreams in which something happened that the dreamer desired, but that did not necessarily come true. Um, uh, there were dreams about property in which the dreamer would dream about um, what they would receive, for example, horses. Um, and there were medicine dreams or visions. And these visions uh, provided insight into the future. Dreams offered the Absaloki a different way of dealing with the future. They did not simply provide information, but were a connection to the spirits and they required interpretation. In 1875, uh, before white men forcibly seized the land of the Absaloki, the nine-year-old Alexia Abu, or as he is called in English, Plenty Poops, dreamed about a major change. He saw that the bison would disappear and that other bovines would take their place. He also dreamed about the chickadee, which is a small bird, uh, an American bird member of the tit family, um, that has to rely on their wits and not their strength in order to uh, survive. Ahu became the leader of the Absaloki uh, at a time when their way of life was disappearing and being taken over by white men's forms of society. So everything was changing, from warfare to education, from the concept of bravery to the relationship they had to their land. And Ahu knew that he had to be like the chickadee, a bird that listens carefully and learns from others, uh, in order to be able to lead his people through the time when the bison would disappear. Now, philosopher Jonathan Lear interprets the attitude of Ahu as radical hope. Radical hope is hope in the unknown, uh, hope that something worthwhile is on the way. The dream about the bison and the chikadu tells Ahu that the traditional way of life is irrevocably disappearing. And this also means the end of the good life for the Absaloki. He cannot imagine what will come next. Neither can he imagine what a good life will look like then, or what hope even might look like. However, in order to be able to move forward, uh, Ahu needs to be open to the possibility that uh, there is a good life. He needs to trust in that in order to be able to lead his people through the changes. The connection with something higher plays a role here. For the Absaloki, there's an other world beside this one. And trusting that life will have meaning once again, that values can take a new form, even though it is yet unclear how, is a form of hope. In very practical terms, this, pra this radical hope resulted in Alexia Ahu practicing uh, agriculture, uh, instead of um, uh, moving around um, and uh, making peace with his white oppressors. He made peace with them um, for one reason, because the Absaloki had suffered many losses in uh, the preceding years in battles with uh, other peoples. In the new way of life that developed, the factors that had previously given life meaning, such as certain forms of battle and bra uh, bravery in combat, disappeared. But not everything was lost. The society of the Absaloki changed, but in a very stripped down form, space for rituals and a personal relationship with the earth remained. We are now on the eve of another great change, another revolution perhaps, uh, an ecological one, whose future is equally unpredictable. 
This trans transformation is taking place in a very different world than that of the absolutely a thoroughly bureaucratic one, mm -hmm. uh, in which there appears to be little scope for the strange and for the new, for uh, a little scope for an open attitude, for dreams, for radical hope. Economic interests play the most important role in policy and in uh, political discussions, uh, and it seems almost impossible that this will change. In this context, hope appears frivolous. It, uh, it looks like a mere palliative. Those in power sometimes declare we need hope uh, simply in order to mask their own complacency. This is why the Swedish climate activist uh, Greta Thunberg told a group of big wigs at the uh, 2019 World Economic Forum in uh, Davos I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to act. I want you to act as if our house is on fire, because it is. Of course, Thunberg is right. Uh, hope without action is no good to us. But the opposite is also true. The philosopher Ernst Bloch writes that we must learn to hope. According to Bloch, Human beings are future-oriented creatures, always focused on how things could be better. People are driven by dreams of a better life and uh, a utopian desire for fulfillment. In his most important work, Das Prinzip Hoffnung, he maps out human utopias in art, philosophy, political movements, fairy tales, literature and all other kinds of expression. So according to Bloch, as uh, human individuals, we are unfinished and the world around us is too. And this is why we always experience a sense that something is missing, something is lacking, but it also means that we can uh, make new things possible. Our subconscious is an important creative source in this process. Uh, that can help us fantasize uh, or imagine uh, a possible better future. By dreaming new worlds, we can guide the action. And taking this seriously, as some thinkers and writers and artists and politicians and activists do, is a way of learning to hope. People obviously do not all have the same dreams. One person may dream of an end to capitalism, while the next person dreams of a new car. And for, Ho for Bloch, a hoping is inevitably connected to ideology critique. In modern societies, he writes, objects and humans and also other animals are seen as goods. Uh, even relationships between human beings are very often measured by their economic value. You might be able to escape from this on a small scale, in maybe in your personal friendships or in your family relations, but consumerism also in, uh, invades these types of relations. You can here, for example, think um, of dating uh, websites where people sort of measure each other in a very uh, technical sense. And the fact that this is happening uh, results in alienation. And I should say here that Bloch wrote this in the 1940s and 50s. And um, in order to confront this alienation, which probably only increased after um, uh, Bloch's analysis, um, changing our way of life as individuals is not sufficient. We should instead learn to hope collectively. And we see glimpses of this in social movements, such as um, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, or the animal rights movement, but it also happens sometimes in mainstream politics. The Partij voor de Dieren, the Party for the Animals, uh, uh, are a good example in the Netherlands. So according to this political party, an other world is both possible and worth fighting for. Uh, the people from the Party of the Animals argue that economic growth should not be a goal and that we should develop a form of doing politics that is not human-centered but instead focuses on the planet and all its inhabitants. We have no planet B and we also have to learn to deal differently with the 
natural world um, simply to be able to survive as humans. Now, the message of the Partij voor de Dieren and also um, uh, of many social justice movements uh, that strive for equality and a better world for all might seem unrealistic, but the Marxist thinker, Kathy Weeks, uh, believes that this is not necessarily the case. She calls attitudes and ideas, such as those of the Partij voor de Dieren, utopian demands. These are demands that make people raise their eyebrows that they laughingly dismiss or think strange. But if these kinds of demands are uh, repeated and explained often enough, they may become embedded in political and social discussions and in that sense gradually become acceptable to the majority. And learning how to treat the earth better is becoming an increasingly pressing issue as we discussed before, as the ecological crisis is going to have more and more of an impact on life as we know it. Uh, the current COVID-19 outbreak is, of course, um, very much uh, connected to how people interact with the planet. Most pandemics and virus, uh, big virus outbreaks in recent decades, from SARS to the mad cow disease, are after all zoonoses, diseases that have passed from uh, non-human animals to humans. The field of disease uh, ecology examines how these processes uh, work, and there's a lot that we do not know yet, but it is clear that, uh, for example, that large-scale intervention uh, in the habitat of uh, wild animals, such as deforestation uh, for industry, and the trading and consumption uh, of wild animals uh, plays a part. And the potential effects of these practices are increased by in, uh, uh, intensive livestock farming, which makes it easier for viruses to spread. And of course, these practices are ethically unsound. The land belongs to animals just as much as it does to human animals. Uh, and keeping animals in captivity is uh, also unjustifiable for the most part. And here the discussion about care and control also um, has many parallels, of course, with the uh, uh, animal situation and, of course, also the human uh, situation and the uh, uh, biopolitical practices that, that guide uh, human life. Um, but I won't go uh, into that. Um, Maybe we can speak about that some other time. But these kinds of outbreaks also show us that our health as humans cannot be seen as separately um, of that of the other creatures with whom we share this world, animals and plants and the others. Now, many of the others with whom we share the world also have dreams, uh, at least in the, in the literal sense. Putti, the cat who came uh, from the war in Lebanon in 2006, had nightmares for a couple of years after he came to uh, live with me. In the common worlds of children and animals, Africa Taylor and Veronica Pacini Kechubau examine new forms of connection and care in which humans are not separate from, her, uh, from their living environment. They look at existing practices and, starting from that point, try to investigate how things could be done differently, instead of deciding upon that beforehand. They zoom in on micro-practices in which preschool children meet non-human animals such as deer, ants and worms. Mutual curiosity is central to these encounters and the power balance is unclear and it shifts. It's not completely, nobody really knows who is stronger. Ants can sting, for example, but the toddler's fingers can pitch. Of course, art can also play a role in, in shifting this existing balance of power or trying to figure out how it can be shifted. Um, uh, and this is also why I'm really sorry that I'm not here with you now, not there with you now at this moment, um, because I think that the exhibition Making Kin is also um, part of this 
project um, because it investigates all the different and makes visible all the different relationalities and networks and ways in which we are interconnected with others, ways in which we can be interconnected um, with others and in which we can co-constitute um, our common uh, life world. And with that, they not only um, offer a critique of the status quo, but they're very actively dreaming and um, trying to offer a glimpse into the unknown and the impossible and um, all of these things that are not here now, but that can become reality at a given moment. Um, there are other good examples, and interestingly, they, these very often also uh, generate new forms of knowledge. And perhaps we are only playing a part in someone else's dream. It's not so easy writing about nothing, writes Patti Smith in her book M Train. Or actually, a cowpoke, which is a kind of cowboy, says that to her in a dream. But we keep on going, he continues, fostering all kinds of crazy hopes. The philosophical cowpoke talks some more, paying no attention to Smith herself. Hey, she says at a certain point, I'm not a dad, I'm not a shade passing, I'm flesh and blood here. The cowpoke still ignores her. He writes something in his notebook. You've got to at least look at me, says Smith. After all, it's my dream. She draws closer to him and sees three words in his notebook. Nope, it's mine. The future is, of course, not nothing, but it's also not something. It's not here yet, and in fact, it will never be here because we only ever experience what happens as the present and thereafter as the past. In M Train, Patty Smith is investigating time. She describes memories and dreams, how she drinks coffee at her regular table in Greenwich Village Cafe. She writes about her favorite crime show, Journeys of the Past, and how she takes these journeys again inside her head. All future is in the past. Time seems to separate us from others, from the dead, from those who are yet to come. But it is precisely what connects us, if you only open yourself up to it. We are already connected to those who are yet to come, to those who are far away, and to those who are very close to us, but who we usually do not notice. And with that connection comes responsibility to dream, to learn to hope, and by doing so, to make something better out of the nothing that is to come. <laughs>